Excellent. So, thank you all for joining us here today for the, the last day of festival. And uh, my favorite, not just because we're almost done, but because we get to talk about tech all day, which is you know near and dear to my heart. And I am honored to be able to do this panel for us because we get all of the best uh, tech people, the CIOs, the people who are leading the charge on all of this. So we've got a stacked panel, so we're going to keep moving right along. Uh, but we do want to make sure that we get some questions from the audience. So because we have so many people in a little bit of time, if you have questions as we go along, throw your hand up and, and we'll try to get to you uh, uh, as we move. So uh, let's, uh, let's start from right down the line with, with Dorothy. Uh, who are you and what do you do? Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Dorothy Aronson. I'm from the National Science Foundation. I'm the CIO. My uh, passion is using advanced technologies to modernize the workforce, the federal workforce in particular. Um, and um, because today is mostly about the changing role of the CIO, I'd like to start by saying almost every day my job changes, the responsibilities associated with my job change. And I've been a CIO since January. And uh, it's wonderful the way the CIOs are uh, collaborating and being asked to collaborate with the uh, Chicos um, and the um, other uh, the CFOs, and we've become very close partners. So that is very empowering and allows a lot more change to happen. So I'm delighted to be doing that. Excellent. Thank you. Lene. Good morning. I'm Linnea Jones. I am the deputy CIO of the intelligence community, and I'm from Office of Director of National Intelligence. And so uh, a little about me. Prior to that, I was at the National Security Agency uh, for many years, and my last position was the Chief of Transformation and Service Transition. Uh, prior to that, I've had a lot of tactical experience uh, working with our partners uh, overseas, you could say, or our service members overseas. And prior to that, a lot of technical experience with architecture development and advancement. Uh, for me, one of my passions and areas that i um, very interested in pushing forward in the intelligence community is the modernization efforts and expanding business with vendors and leveraging technology uh, from a uh, commercial and blend it with the government world. So that's one of the areas. Um, and that goes across many cadres from cybersecurity to um, uh, AI, um, advancing that, those efforts and many other pieces. Hey, Gary, you're, you're, most of the people here probably uh, know who you are, but for the uninitiated. Well, I'm Gary Washington. I'm the uh, Chief Information Officer of the Department of Agriculture. Uh, before that, I was the CIO of APHIS and NRCS and USDA, and I spent a couple of uh, years at OMB. Um, 10 years in the military. Uh, my passion right now is making sure that uh, we modernize uh, the Department of Agriculture and uh, use technology to provide value to our farmers, ranchers, uh, and scientists in uh, Department of Agriculture and our customers and citizens. So, and managing uh, you know, current IT portfolio in a secure fashion. David, you're, uh, you're the newest CIO on our panel here, so go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm David Chow, I'm the CIO. Uh, I started back in August, late August, and I'm fairly new. I've been a career fed for uh, 18 years, but I'm fairly new to the CIO family. Uh, and thanks to my colleagues for welcoming me to the, to the CIO family. My passion is really to find ways to collaborate with the stakeholders, the program offices, to make sure that we're listening to, listening to them, as well as finding ways to be able to address the program issues. Excellent. So the, the theme of today's panel is talking about the evolving role of the CIO, how that's changed over the years, some of the recent developments, and, and what that means for how you all are helping agencies meet their mission. But before we jump right into that, I think I'd be remiss, we have two of the CIOs who are involved in two of the biggest, newest programs in government that everybody loves to talk about, the Centers of Excellence and the Technology Modernization Fund Awards. So, David, let's start with you on that. You're coming in as the second agency, uh, HUD is the second agency to uh, join the Centers of Excellence program. What sparked you to want to go through that process, do it with GSA rather than just try to go, out, go it on your own? So there, there are some backstory to this. Uh, so before I started, uh, my agency has been working with uh, GSA basically to have that conversation to understand how do we find ways to modernize, modernize our environment, uh, jumpstart 
the overall programs to make sure that we're able to deliver quickly. So uh, my agency has been talking to GSA as well as Gary and USDA. And before I started, I actually had a meeting, uh, my first meeting with Gary. And that, that was really just to understand exactly what the COE entails, some of the benefits, some of the, some of the feedback, as well as some of the disadvantages of participating within the COE. And every, everything turned out to be really positive. Gary has been a great mentor for me, and he actually came over to HUD a couple times to make sure that, to walk me through some of the anxiety that I have. So, uh, but for me, it's really having that dedicated resources to, to jumpstart the, the program that's, that's sorely needed within my agency, that we're able to leverage the program expertise to be able to find ways to resolve this problem. And you're going to be doing things a little differently than, than USDA, David. Yeah. We'll, we'll come back to that in a second. First, though, Gary, as uh, someone who just finished up the phase one process, you're getting ready to start phase two, what is David about to go through? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, the culture at HUD and USDA are completely different. And at USDA, um, you know, this, this was a huge change. Um, so I, I think what David is going to go through is uh, he's, he's really going to have to work with his programs uh, to explain the benefits of this and partner with them to make sure they're part of this whole process. Uh, phase one is about planning and assessment, uh, coming up with a uh, target environment for phase two that's going to be implemented. And that's not really just about IT. You know, uh, you're going to have to include people and explain to them, you know, uh, what they the benefits what's going on and, and the value that it's going to bring to uh, your program community. If I can jump in real quick, uh, you're exactly right. We're, we're through three weeks into our interagency agreement and there has been a lot of excitement within my agency, within the program offices, but there has also has been a lot of questions. So the change management aspect is something that I didn't really anticipate, but that's something that we're working through right now. And I feel like we are just perfectly timed to get some, some substance out of you, Gary. With phase one, what, what came out of that? What did you find as you move into phase two? What fundamental principles are you coming at? What big changes are you looking at? Well, I, I um, was there some technology benefits and changes, but I, I think uh, as a department, I found that a lot of people uh, we're very enthusiastic and uh, we're team players in terms of uh, making sure, you know, being a part of the change. You know, like David said, there's a huge change management part of this. A lot of this is new for the Department of Agriculture. Um, we're very decentralized. People have been here for a long time. So we're basically going to uh, create a new environment to work in for them. Um, so we, we've uh, obviously closed a lot of data centers. Uh, there were some cybersecurity benefits that we have um, experienced working with GSA. Uh, we've realized some cost savings just based on what we've achieved in phase one. So a lot of this is going to carry over into phase two, and we're very excited about you know, what the next year to 18 months is going to hold. Excellent. And then just to wrap up this part, and then we'll, we'll make sure we get the rest of the panel included in all this. But uh, David, as we mentioned off the bat, uh, your experience is going to be different. What how are you going to be using the Centers of Excellence differently? Uh, and what, what tweaks are you making based on what, what you've seen so far? So for our purpose, we're really focusing on the customers, working on the collaboration, making sure that our program offices are leading the overall assessment effort. So the IT actually comes after the program has completed the entire assessment within phase one. That's where then the IT will come in to start going through the execution. And that's, that's uh, somewhat different. And also, we're not focusing as much about the infrastructure technology. We're more focusing on how do we find the right solution, for example, with our grant lifecycle process. Finding a, a solution leveraging either cloud or on-premise capability to, to be able to address the issues. But first and foremost is to look at how do we process, go through a process of engineering for the current grant process to improve the agency mission, to improve the the overall citizen experience with HUD. I, I, I think that's interesting because that really is your central mission, right? The yes. grants that you're, that you're putting out there, and that's your focus. So you've got this program. I, I want to talk about TMF, but we'll push that to maybe toward the end of the panel. Dorothy, 
from your perspective, you don't need the COEs, you don't need TMF, right? There's other ways that you can get things done. And more recently, CIOs have been getting more authorities. You have Fatara, you have the presidential executive order. How's all that been going at, at NSF? Are you able to do more these days? Uh, yes, I think that not only from the CIO perspective, but we actually have the opposite situation from these two organizations in that, in, and probably the intel agencies are more like uh, NSF in that, we're at, we have advanced technologies. We're at market across the board. You know, we don't have the aging infrastructure that needs to be replaced. Nothing like a mainframe, uh, no HP 2000, which is what I learned to code on. Um, but, so what we're able to do is um, agile implementation, taking small modern technology, bits of modern technology and inserting them in to uh, push forward into the next generation. I mean, NSF, we want to be the leaders. We want to be ahead of industry in our in our IT. Um, so we don't, uh, uh, so what we've been doing is taking, uh, we don't have the scary kind of change where the whole organization has to adopt a change, and so we're able to implement um, by um, optional, in the, the people who want, the, the innovators who want to accept and adopt change come and um, welcome it. And embrace it, and um, and what happens? What we we've, we've what we've been seeing is that the rest, the majority of the community doesn't care. So if uh, if the innovators introduce something and and it works, the rest of the community likes it. And then of course there's always <coughs> laggards, which is probably where uh, I, I would be personally. Is that that's how I deal with my iPhone. Um, but uh, there, so there's some benefit to being a Luddite now and again. Well, right? I'm just right. so so. Uh, and those people sometimes are very hard to move forward. Uh, and but but uh, so our problems are sort of reversed from, from these organizations. That's a good question. And imagine uh, because you work with the scientific research community, so many of them, I imagine, are out on the edge when it comes to technology. Are are they pushing you along, or are they just happy with whatever you can help with? It depends on their area of science, really. Um, and also their imagination. Uh, so, you know, some people have time to, uh, to try to push their uh, ideas forward into the workplace, and others understand. I mean, National Science Foundation funds adva basic advanced research, so they shouldn't be bringing things to the desktop uh, right away, but we are also working at NSF on something, um, uh, on accelerating some of that delivery of advanced technologies to to the um, people. So um, those accelerators uh, are an opportunity for us in the operational part of the organization to feel a part of the mission. So um, pulling the advanced technologies into the workforces, into the workplace is something that we're very excited about trying. Excellent. And so often it feels like, you know, we've, we've heard that OMB and the administration talk about this a lot, that you have, if you're talking about technology, you should be talking about the mission. Uh, Linnea, I imagine in your area, that's not probably as much of an issue. I feel like technology is the mission for what you try to do. Correct, so technology is the foundation for the mission. Um, I think uh, within the intelligence community for all of the agencies, the mission is forefront of what we're looking to accomplish um, from a safety, security, a relationship, ensuring that uh, stakeholders and needs are met. So I would say that technology goes hand in hand with that. Um, it is a constant uh, evolution process as far as um, innovation. So innovation is very big in the intelligence community through multiple agencies. In addition to that, um, as Dorothy was speaking, I was thinking of the SEC DevOps model of continuous uh, improvements in uh, ways to inject new technology and from a security development operation from you know, bringing smaller um, applications, development uh, efforts inject them to the operational environments on a smaller scale. And so I think it depends on what the efforts are, but because of how large um, the intelligence community is, and then the partnerships, the partnerships with Department of Defense, uh, of course, the mission hand in hand with that, and partnerships with um, commercial industry and others. So throughout all of that, there's always the theme of mission front and center. Definitely, and maybe I could reframe it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I feel as though the, the intelligence community is a thing. It's always been the, the community, right? Um, but post 9-11, we, we got ODNI. We got this unification of those efforts. 
And from that perspective, where you sit in that office, it's all about being able to share information and knitting these, these agencies together. Could you do that without tech? I mean, it, it, how, how fundamental is that? So absolutely not. Um, I would say tech is providing, or technology in general is providing the foundation for the data and information and the transport, the network for people to receive the information, right? So if you think about um, how ODNI was formed and how you brought up after 9-11, some of the stovepipes within agencies, the lack there of sharing information, the lack there of having a, um, a common understanding of everything was some of the inefficiencies that uh, we look from a CIO perspective, ICCIO, to help mitigate as far as uh, interoperability, collaboration, sharing data, creating uh, reference architectures for the community to use uh, for those type of items. But it, it, but it is something that we as IT um, leaders have to be able to, sh to share with everyone. So it used to be that IT people were unique and centralized in, 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 a, in a central place in the organization, and now everyone um, has that capability. And so part of the change that we have to be looking f for is how can we um, uh, allow everyone to do their own thing with the tools that we provide, as opposed to controlling all of the things that people do. Absolutely, I think it's a balance um, between that. Um, so, you know, when I when you mentioned that, I think of some of the efforts. For instance, uh, one of the reference architectures, uh, the ICAM reference architecture, which is the identity credentials and access management reference architecture, which talks about um, providing data and information so people can access things more securely. Um, completely agree, the, if we look at the amount of data that's being produced and then the just spring of AI and ML all around us and it's just continuously evolving and growing and people aren't even realizing the amount of technology that we're using on a day-to-day -day basis. And so with that, it's creating that balance, um, even you know, for us as individuals trying to create the balance of how much tech are we embracing without even realizing it. Um, on many platforms. Excellent. Now, sticking with the way, the, the evolving role of the CIO, right, the name of our panel here, uh, Linnea, when you first came in as a CIO, was there an obvious buy-in from everyone in, in your community that, that tech had to be a linchpin of meeting that mission? How much, how much buy-in did everyone already have and how much did you have to kind of uh, inject yourself into the conversation? So I would say that um, luckily that the buy-in was there. Um, each of the intelligence community agencies do have their uh, individual CIOs, and so we partner with their CIOs and their organizations, their technical technology organizations, in order to partner for capabilities, advancement efforts, and to push the envelope forward, as people so say. So maybe you have a little bit of a buffer because you have those other CIOs dealing with their agencies. Absolutely. So it's it's definitely um, it's uh, it's a. A, a team effort, right? It's a combined uh, grouping, if you would. It's not just the ICCIO, um, but it's the 17 of us working together. Uh, we do provide the balance of working with the uh, Director of National Intelligence and providing other government as far as updates, but we do partner, and it's mentally that's mainly what we're doing, is working with the other agencies. It's, it's a team sport. Absolutely. Drink. <laughs> Gary, you've been around a little bit longer in CIO roles in, 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 uh, in the government. How has, have you seen the role change? I, I think um, the, the CIOs, the expectation of the CIO is to be a business partner and not so much in the, in the back office, you know, um, talking about, you know, basic technologies. Because there's a, there's a uh, uh, assumption that you know, IT is gonna always be running and everything and you have to make it happen. 
but uh, I, I think as the CIO today, you need to be able to talk to your uh, your leadership in your, in your agency and your, in your colleagues and programs about business value, you know, how is it uh, increasing their time to market, how more efficient are they becoming, how much money are they saving. You know, it's really about having that business conversation and showing that business value from IT and not so much talking about things they really don't want to hear or understand. Like, you know, I built a server today or, you know, or, or what have you. So um, you need to be a part of the, um, the, the leadership team. And, and talk about technology from a strategic point of view. Now, David, you're at a different agency, so you're effectively different from that, but you're also some fresh eyes on this. As we have things like Fatara and the EO in place now that uh, agencies are supposed to be giving more authority to CIOs, is, are you seeing that as a reality? I do. I, I, um, I actually see um, so very similar to what Gary was talking about. Um, the, the CIO needs to be able to value to the agency to, to the program offices. And the bottom line is that that's where the, the, the value that the CIO brings to the table that how do you use <clears throat> how do you use IT, how do you use technology to help create efficiency within the agency as well as within the program offices. And I think with Fatara, what will happen is that the role for the CIO will be centralized, the resources will be centralized. But there are still shadow IPs out there that, that needs to be retained, that needs to be and, and the reason for shadow IT is really because of you know, lack of productivity or lack of delivery from the main IT shop. That's why you have program offices spin up their own IT shop. So it will be a slow transition, but I do see that eventually for the sake of consolidating the resources to, to create efficiency within the organization, that, that the overall IT resources and, and the role will be centralized to the CIO but also at the same time that the CIO needs to make sure that we're, <clears throat> we're constantly providing value to the organization. We have a seat at the table to make sure that we're able to contribute not only to the IT improvement, but also to the overall programmatic improvement. Yeah, I, I'd like to stay on shadow IT for, uh, for a moment, just because I feel like maybe four or five years ago, I was hearing CIOs talking about shadow IT. Some of them were saying, you know, we're not able to deliver everything, so we have to support that, you know, let people come out of the woodwork, let the, tell us what you're using so we can at least secure it, but it's okay. Others were saying, no, we can't do that, we've got to lock it all down. What are, what are all your thoughts on that? How has that changed over the years? Does anybody want to jump on that first? Can I start? Really? So, I think perspectives for the, from the CIOs are going to be different. Um, we're, we're, not we're about to find out. Yeah, we're, we're, not a same, we're not a same person, so each person will have his own view. Uh, from my perspective, I, Initially, I would allow the shadow IT, simply I mean, for, for my example, with HUD, uh, we do have shadow IT, but how do I make sure that my agency, my organization is able to build that credibility to eventually take over that the capability that's being developed by, by my program offices? That would take time. I, I've been there for six weeks. Um, You're not done we're, yet? We're done. <laughs> I'm, I'm halfway there. I'm halfway there. <laughs> Um, so it's a constant battle, but I think as, 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 as long as we're providing the value, as long as we're, we're showing the credibility, we're, we're, we're able to deliver based on what, what we promise and build that credibility, I think through time that we're able to start, fend, you know, just fending off the, the shadow IT simply because for program offices, why would, they, why would they want to spend their resources focusing on the IT area, something that they're not, they don't have any strength in? They will want to make sure that they're able to provide better policy or finding ways to be able to um, examine or investigate a certain situations. So that's my perspective. I'm sure that if my colleagues will have much different perspectives. Yeah, and we'd love to hear that. I, I, just, I was remiss before, I should, uh, just for the audience, in case anyone's not familiar, Shadow IT, generally we're talking about uh, non or unapproved apps, that sort of thing that, that people use in an agency. So uh, rather than using the the team uh, uh, conversation channel, somebody's using uh, their Gchat or Slack or some other unapproved thing that, that they're just not supposed to be using. So that, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, so uh, we've had shadow IT in uh, USDA, but uh, amazing, something happened when our current secretary came in and there's been a massive push towards consolidating IT. You know, we had 22 CIOs, we got down to eight assistant CIOs and one CIO. Uh, we've 
consolidated uh, all the IT in the mission areas to uh, under the leadership of the assistant CIOs and we're doing it at the department level as well. But with that, it's forcing us to provide those services and provide better services. And I mean, basically that's how I feel about it. That's what we get paid for, you know? And it's forcing us to have conversations with our business partners about what they were missing and what they really need and trying to provide cost-effective solutions for them. It's gonna uh, address their business needs. So uh, I, I think the evolution, I think shadow IT is, is still gonna be a slow march but uh, we're getting there uh, more rapidly than I thought in terms of actually having the CIOs actually not be expected to do their job and also have the resources to do their job and be able to make strategic decisions and work their missionary leaders. So would, would you advocate having more of a, an iron grip on not allowing, but so long as you're, you're providing what's needed? I, I, I don't think it's an iron grip thing. Um, I just think, you know, we, we need to work together as partners, because David made a great point, and I tell this to people all the time. You know, IT is not their job. You know, IT is the CIO's job. But we have to do it well and provide value. So, I mean, you really need to reach out and have discussions with people about what they need and make sure you show value and show the benefits and everything. Okay. We'll just keep going right down the line. Uh, so, Lynette. Sure, so. Talk about shadow IT, not IT in the shadows, right? I understand. I understand. I'll say this one quote, and I'll say it's not my quote, but you're only as strong as your weakest link. Um, whether you are providing mission IT, business IT, enterprise corporate IT, it's still IT. And from a vulnerability, a security uh, perspective, it's important that we have insight to the overall domains. Because if not, on one side, it doesn't matter what's upgraded, migrated, enhanced. If you still have legacy architecture applications that aren't compliant, those are still ways to have security vulnerabilities within the, the overall system. So when we look at it from that aspect, I think that there, I don't agree with a, say, an iron grip on it, but I think there's a balance of being able to inject new technology, idea, applications, projects, efforts, and be able to work that process of why are organizations setting up shadow IT and resolving that issue as opposed to um, allowing it to happen. And I want to hear your thoughts. And just before we do, I want to remind everyone we'll have uh, just a few minutes left after this, so start uh, thinking of your questions. So I'm going to be brief. Um, I, I don't see uh, the term shadow IT as being accurate um, because I believe that the, at least at NSF, which again is a small organization, the um, people who are doing that work are doing it to uh, advance the mission just like everyone else. So shadow IT has a negative connotation and I, I really, I call these people local entrepreneurs. Um, and, and what I do is I ask them what they're up to and I ensure that they meet the security standards and then I'm done. Um, I, I feel like if, if one of them has an idea that's better than the central idea, you know, make it available to everyone. Um, and that has been uh, very effective. Again, we're in different places uh, evolutionarily and so those people who are doing it are so proud of the work they're doing that um, they do offer it and share it and um, we adopt it if it's better. But just to add to that, oh, sure. completely agree with her, because we're very large, and in that same, there's extremely brilliant, bright people that are bringing in ideas every day. So I think it's important to have that process and that understanding, the documentation, the security aspects, um, the permissions, those type of things, so that way it doesn't create, say, a hole, but also allowing innovation, flexibility, the agile uh, ability to bring stuff in. I'm glad we went down this rabbit hole because what I'm hearing is, is seems to be a true evolution in the CIO role from, from what all of you are saying, which is not just a job to deliver an IT system, but to enable the mission, right? What we're here to talk about today. And that's exactly what I think, even though it was slightly different from all of you, I feel like I heard that from all of you, which mm -hmm. is it, it's not so important how it's getting done, we're gonna make sure it gets done. Uh, I can keep going, but do we have any questions from the audience here? Um, Right over here. We got microphones coming, so people at home can hear. 
Hi, Sandy Mestri. Um, we're talking about the evolving CIO and before we're talking about the workforce. So as your roles are evolving, how are you looking at your staff, your employees, and how are you working with them and retraining or looking for new talent? Because with this whole modernization effort, it's a different set of skill sets to get you there. So I'd love to hear and hear from you all, share with us how you're going back. If I can piggyback on that too, just to add, uh, make it a two-parter. Uh, how are you working with your uh, OCIO staff and how are you working with the, the agency staff at large? Well, it, you know, the, the Center of Excellence Activities um, have, uh, we, we've had to have some serious conversations about uh, preparing the workforce for the new environment. And, and there's, some, there's some challenges to that. Um, we, we, we have a very mature IT workforce at USDA. And um, for where we're going, our secretary wants us to have a, uh, like a self-service with digital portals and all that kind of thing. And that's not the environment we're in today. But we want to have more modern technologies like AI, robotic process, automation, and all that kind of thing. So you, know, you, you have to get the people that want to be prepared prepared. So we've been working very closely with our Chief Human Capital Officer and the leadership of, of the agency and giving people opportunities. Like we did a talent search and targeted seven men and women and we made them a part of the Center of Excellence activities that we have going on to help prepare them. And then you have folks that, you know, they may not want to be so inclined to, to learn something new. You know, you have to deal with them as well. So uh, you, you know, there's, there's many moving parts to this, but at the end of the day, you have to prepare the workforce to provide value to our customers because we're in a customer service business, so to speak. So um, I would suggest, you know, get started early and often, or get started early and start having those conversations and get a, a workforce plan in place and start transitioning people and, and, and get your component agencies involved in, in, in what's going on because you know you don't want people to feel left out, but make sure it's an inclusive process. We're, uh, we're getting a little short, so I'm gonna see if we can fit in two more questions. In the center here? Mike's gonna be coming from behind you. Erica Van Steen, Heron and Associates. Um, so I think this is sort of building off of what you started to talk about. I'm really curious about the emerging and disruptive technologies that are coming into your environments and how those could actually you know, enable mission. But particularly in the context of uh, those technologies along with your role, knowing that some agencies now have chief data officers and chief technology officers as well, where does the CIO fit in all of that? Um, especially as these disruptive and emerging technologies start to blend those roles more and more. So um, earlier, actually Gary was speaking about the evolving role of the CIO and immediately thought about it's just not the CIO. We there's articles about you know, multiple C suite positions, right? So it's a partnership between the say the CIO, the CFO, the chief data officer, the chief technology officer of that team, if you would, looking overall at not just the technology aspect, but the funding, how the mission ties into and everything like that. So when we talk about that. I think those the roles are evolving, not just probably within our respective agencies, but around uh, the world even, because they're maturing as technology becomes more influential in our lives. Uh, if you look at the disruptive technology, and as the previous uh, guest was speaking about the role of the workforce, you can see the change in the dynamic of like how we use our phones, how we communicate, um, you know, our ability to. Uh, not just email, but the chat abilities and just multiple alerting and mechanisms. And so there has to be a way to infuse and inject that disruptive technology or else it's not going to stop the disruption, right? The disruption will continue on. So it's about embracing that disruption and using it for your benefit or being able to um, have it be a part of your workforce. Right. And unfortunately, we are out of time. So uh, this has been a fantastic panel. Uh, please let them know you agree. Thank <laughs> you.